I dreamed about the city of God last night. This has been the most surprising vision of all, for I confess, I don't like cities. I've never been particularly moved when reading passages about the city of God or the new Jerusalem. But this city was unlike any I've ever seen. None of the crowding, the grinding noise, the sooty concrete, none of the industrial inhumanity. What I saw was more like a Mediterranean city. Whitewashed buildings, winding walkways, stairs leading up to open doorways. Everything had an elegant, curving whimsy to it. All windows and doors were arched. There were many domed roofs. Architecture as poetry, soothing to the soul. The place was filled with a soft light. It reminded me of pictures I've seen of the beautiful Greek island of Santorini or the old city of Jerusalem. But of course, it was enchanting in ways I've never experienced on earth. Each winding path made so many turns, ascending and descending stairs, coming suddenly upon fountains and courtyards, with any number of possible doors and gateways leading off. It was the sort of place you would want to explore for a long time. But what most captured me was the laughter I heard within those bright rooms. Laughter kind and playful, gentle and true. Laughter like it was the native tongue of the place. Welcome to the Ransom Tar Podcast. I'm John Eldridge, and what you just heard is an actual dream that I had and wrote about in a book that I've just released called All Things New, Heaven, Earth, and the Restoration of Everything You Love. And I was really reluctant to share these pictures, but at the same time, I just had to because I know that they begin to help you find your own. And this is the fourth in a series of podcasts about the restoration of all things, about our future, about the hope that is ours to take hold of, the hope our hearts so desperately need. This dream about the city of God is the introduction into chapter 8 about what, what is it that we spend our unending life doing, and is it here on the new earth? And this is just going to blow your minds. Chapter 8. What do we actually do? Each mortal thing does one thing and the same, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. Gerard Manley Hopkins. Evil is gone. The world is restored. We are restored. Justice has been served, and we are lavishly rewarded. The only natural thing to do, the only appropriate thing to do at that point, is pop a cork, open a cask, push back the furniture, and throw a riotous party. Of course we all head off to celebrate at a feast. I have no doubt it carries on for weeks probably months. There are quite a few stories that need telling and many reunions that must take place. And then what? What do we do after the wedding feast of the Lamb? Honestly, I think this is as far as most people have ever given it a thought. If we do talk at all about the joy of the coming kingdom, we talk about the feast and nothing more. Our imaginations seem to end right there, falling off the edges of the banquet like ancient sailors feared they would fall off the end of the world. I'm looking forward to the gala, for sure. But at some point, the feast comes to a close, and just as every newly married couple drives away from their reception, we then have the rest of our unending life before us. What do we do with it? This is probably the one aspect of our future most shrouded in religious vapors, fogged in by a pea soup of vagueness, emptiness, and heavenly foam. What is it that we do? Well, my dear friend Brent died. A few folks wanted to use a song at his service. Because of its country-western style and religious message, it seemed to them to fit the bill perfectly. The refrain speaks of a man whose task on earth is finished, and so he rests high on that mountain. Now, I happen to like the work of Vince Gill, 
But I loathe this song then, and I loathe it still, because of its charming religious appeal and grotesque message. Your life is over. Go rest now. Forever. This is the best we can come up with when it comes to eternal living? No wonder life here seems far more exciting. And life here seems far more exciting for the vast majority of people, witnessed by the fact that no one you know is fantasizing about heaven. You will wake one morning, and the earth will be made new. On that same wonder-filled morning, you also will be made new. What adventures then unfold? What great tasks are set before us? I'm not sure if it was the graceful, mesmerizing movements of the gazelle and impala, or the fierce presence of lions nearby, or the majesty of the elephant, but I will never forget the look on my daughter-in-law Susie's face, a look so rare in this world, the shining countenance of childhood wonder. Eyes wide and glistening, mouth agape and smiling, she was utterly captivated as the rose-colored lights of sunrise revealed the vast array of animals and dancers while music itself swelled to match the scene. We were in London, watching the musical The Lion King. Surely you've seen the movie. The opening number is worth watching again this week to help your imagination seize the new earth with both hands. As the sun rises on the African savanna and flocks of birds soar overhead, God's menagerie of fantastic creatures all assemble to honor their new prince. The scene is borrowed straight from Genesis, the morning of creation, when all the angels sang for joy. It's a moment when music is required, fitting hand in glove with creation. You'll remember Aslan sang Narnia into being. The opening song begins heralding the moment of our birth and how each one of us steps blinking into a dazzling world filled with more than can possibly be seen or done in a lifetime. Exactly. Precisely. Couldn't have said it better myself. More to see than can ever be seen, more to do than can ever be done, unless you have all the time in a world without time to see it and to do it. Well then, we haven't begun to scratch the surface of the mysteries of the earth, haven't seen or experienced a fraction of this world our home. What joys await us? What adventures call? This would be a far better song to sing at funerals. That is, if we also explain that our dear ones are in no way dead at all, that they will be right there with us when the new sun rises on the new earth, we should all stand and sing for the morning of recreation. The excitement has only just begun. The next chapter of our story is precisely that, the chapter that follows all the chapters before and fits them perfectly. God is still telling a story. The next chapter is not disconnected from the rest. I know it feels totally disconnected, but it is not. If we'll look at our future, in light of the story God has been telling, it will banish the fog like a strong summer sun. Let's start with Genesis, the first Eden. Let us make human beings in our image, to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Genesis 1. Our powerful and creative Father makes us, in His image, powerful and creative sons and daughters. He gives us the earth like a wedding present, instructs us to reign, and endows each human being with talents and gifts to carry out that task. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
also included in the earth a latent potency, veiled powers and treasures, things like music and literature and science hidden in creation like Easter eggs so that we might have the joy of discovering them. Hey, look at this. I'm starting to put some things together, and I think it's called music. There are notes and chords, meter, and if you stretch a string just right, it makes a perfect C. Isn't this incredible? Think of the potential that was waiting in the first Eden for glorious men and women to discover. Then the long story of human history follows, filled with glory and tragedy. God's children prove themselves capable of marvelous works. We also prove ourselves capable of terrible deeds. Evil ravages the earth and the human race. Things go from bad to worse until our loving Father intervenes. Jesus Christ comes to overthrow the evil one and ransom us. He begins the healing of our lives. He gives each of us a role in the church's great mission. In the next chapter, our powerful and creative Father recreates us and the earth. He then tells us to do exactly what he told Adam and Eve to do. Reign. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Revelation 5. Do you follow the story? Do you see the exciting connection? Glorious men and women are once again given a glorious world in order to do the very things it is in our nature to do. Only this time around, with far greater powers, magnificent even, we have within us a latent potency, talents and gifts unrealized, soon to be made new. The renewed earth will be even more responsive to our leadership than the first time around. So Dallas Willard invites us to use our God-given imagination. We should think of our destiny as being absorbed in a tremendously creative team effort with unimaginably splendid leadership on an inconceivably vast plane of activity with ever more comprehensive cycles of productivity and enjoyment. This is the eye hath not seen, neither ear heard, that lies before us in the prophetic vision. What will you do in the coming kingdom? The simple, stunning answer is, you will do everything you were born to do. All things new. Up till now, I've been speaking almost exclusively of the renewal of creation, the earth in all its splendor, and the animal kingdom. I did so to help us grasp that we get our beautiful world back. But it's also my attempt to wipe away the religious fog regarding heaven. However, at the epicenter of the renewal of all things is a city, and not just any city. It is the city of God, his very own home, where he makes his dwelling with mankind. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look! God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. Come with me. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So he took me in the Spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as crystal. The city wall was broad and high, with twelve gates guarded by twelve angels. And the names of the twelve tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were written the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. When he measured it, he found it was a square, as wide as it was long. 
In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. Revelation 21. A massive, stunning, glorious place whose presence allows us to think about the renewal of the arts and sciences, education, and the trades. The promise is that God will not make some things new, but all things new. Begin with the obvious. We know there is music in the kingdom. Just think of what the music will be, the intimate and the grand. Music played on a single violin, music played by a massive orchestra and choir. Drums, a cappella voices. Think of all the talented musicians who dwell there. We get to hear the work of the great composers played by their own hand. We will hear the angels sing in their own tongues as well. I expect the city will be filled with music. I'm sure we'll be dancing on the tables. Follow me now. But who makes that music? Who makes the instruments upon which that music is played? You do, my friends. At least those of you who want to will. I'd love to learn to play the cello. It's always been one of my favorite instruments. I'd love to let loose on some taiko drums, too. We're not just talking about organ and choir here. For all the ethnic music from around the world will dwell in that place, and joyful hearts will want to make music day and night. I wonder what instrument Jesus plays. I wonder what our Father's voice sounds like, how far it carries. You will hear your Father sing. Oh my, the thought of it brings me such happiness. I'd love to learn other languages. And won't it be wonderful that every tribe and tongue is there to teach us? Speaking of learning, imagine the scope of education in the city. Jonathan Edwards believed that learning will be one of the great pleasures of the kingdom. He pointed out that though we are resurrected, we are still finite. I doubt very much that God would simply dump all knowledge into us the moment we arrive. We grow and develop in the kingdom by learning, with renewed and strengthened minds filled with the Holy Spirit. Imagine taking philosophy from Thomas Aquinas or any of the great thinkers from the ages, Pascal perhaps, though he might be busy teaching math. St. Paul will hold classes on the Torah. Galileo will give lectures on the stars. Oh, the joy of it. I expect we will study history under the very figures who lived in those eras. Moses and Elijah appeared to chat with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, which was a glimpse into the kingdom. Lincoln will teach classes on the Civil War, and Churchill will retell the Battle of Britain. I'm not quite sure how imagination and memory come together to honor history. Perhaps we will see it as it is being told by those who lived it. Perhaps we will go further and enter into it, for all times are accessible to our glorious God, and he keeps all times within himself. There is no question those stories and episodes will be accessible to us somehow and vividly. Think of the sciences in the kingdom. Inquiry and discovery are essential if we would reign over creation. And by the way, the implication of a renewed heavens includes the universe. I mentioned earlier that we'll be able to explore the microscopic world, which is as vast a universe as the one above. All that there is yet to know, all that this precious knowledge will allow us to develop as friends share and build on the revelations given to us about the created order. The combustion engine will seem a crass and primitive thing to the great minds in the kingdom. What new glories are waiting to be discovered? Wonders leading to wonders, leading to creative breakthroughs, only imagined in science fiction on this side. And what of the trades? We know we have homes and dwellings in the kingdom. Who furnishes those homes? Who makes the chairs, the tables, the tapestries? I've always wanted to work with my hands. I'd love to have the time and skill and mentors to build boats with hand tools and sail them, learning to navigate by the stars. Again, I am not being fanciful. I am utterly serious. 
you are healed and restored as a human being with all the faculties of personhood given to you by God. So the question is, what have you always dreamed of doing? What gifts have you yearned to express? What have you always wanted to be great at? These things are part of your personhood. They're how God created you, and they will be even more glorious in the recreated you. Dream, my friends. What if you watch someone else doing and long to do it as beautifully as they can? That's another way of accessing the hidden dreams and capacities in your own soul. Perhaps you've watched someone amazing at architecture or teaching, horsemanship, physics, cooking, or engineering, and something in you leapt, longing to do the same. Well, there you go. That is part of your personhood and it will be released into fullness in the kingdom. As a boy, I was taken many summers to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I vividly remember marveling, there's the wonder again, at the stage, the sets and costumes, the beautiful lighting under the stars, the skill of the actors and directors, the artistry of the entire production made my heart ache. I longed to be a Shakespearean actor, and though I realized a bit of that dream as a young man, I had to put it away, as many of us had to put our dreams away in this life. Imagine theater in the kingdom. The joy of watching will be second only to the joy of those offering it. Certainly, storytelling is one of the great pleasures in the kingdom. God clearly takes it very seriously. He made reality in the shape of a story. Would you like to write, illustrate, act, produce? Perhaps we get to take workshops from the great artists. These things are not obliterated when we step into the life to come. God renews all things. Willard assures us, we will not sit around looking at one another or at God for eternity, but will join the eternal logos, reign with him in the endlessly ongoing creative work of God. It is for this that we were each individually intended as both kings and priests. A place in God's creative order has been reserved for each one of us from before the beginnings of cosmic existence. His plan is for us to develop as apprentices to Jesus to the point where we can take our place in the ongoing creativity of the universe. Just as Adam and Eve were commissioned to, only this time around on a higher level, with greater powers creatively engaged in very real and tangible things. We know we eat in the city. Surely the joy of eating doesn't end with the feast. Who grows the food? Who brings it to market? What chefs prepare it? It's unlike God to just zap these things into existence While we sit around doing nothing, bored to death, he creates us to create. Jesus linked the promise of the restoration directly to familiar things like fields and lands, confirming the earlier prophetic visions of the Old Testament. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Isaiah 65. I would love to own and work my own vast vineyard. I'd love to try my hand at the winemaking process and some even stronger things. City life, country life. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. Revelation 22. This is an actual river flowing through an 
actual city. Its waters are crystal clear and flowing with life, liquid life flowing as a river. Growing on the banks of that river are real trees. Their roots go down to drink those waters of life, which is probably why they are the trees of life. I adore rivers. They are high on my list of favorite things. I love trees, too. It makes me so happy to know that even in the city, there are rivers and trees, and doubly happy that we find our healing in them, from them. Imagine the great parks in the city. I wonder what colors the fruit of the tree of life are. Are they different each of the 12 months? What does that queenly fruit taste like? Will it be something entirely new? Or will it taste like all your favorite childhood flavors almost tasted? Your mother's blackberry pie or chocolate, vanilla ice cream, because the promise was coming through them to your child heart? They'll be delicious, I have no doubt. And how large are those trees? They heal nations. So they must be magnificent, tall as redwoods, spreading as great banyan trees? And how have you pictured the river? Subdued and delicate, rather small, more like a canal? The Thames is almost 300 yards across as it flows through London. Ships navigate it. The Nile is almost a mile wide in Cairo. For some reason, our famished imaginations picture the river of life as more of a stream. Do we only drink? from the river, respectfully dipping our cup? Or do we get to wade in it, swim in it? Come on now. You will be standing on the banks of a river flowing with the water of life. You've been working up a thirst for that water all your life. I'm diving in. The river flows through the city, but then it must flow out into the countryside. Do fly fishermen get to fish its waters at that point? Do families picnic on its banks on Sunday afternoons? We'll soon find out. For I believe those who love the city life will find their joy in the city, and those who love the agrarian life will find their joy in the country. Both are promised in the coming kingdom. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. Isaiah 41. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Isaiah 61. This reminds me of one of my all-time favorite short stories, The Man Who Planted Trees by Jean Giono. The lovely little tale describes the anonymous life of a humble shepherd who transforms an entire countryside by planting trees in a wasteland. The story begins with the narrator, a young man at the time, taking a trek on foot through the rough hills of rural France. And after three days of walking, I found myself in the midst of unparalleled desolation. I camped near the vestiges of an abandoned village. I had run out of water the day before and had to find some. These clustered houses, although in ruins like an old wasp's nest, suggested that there must have once been a spring or well here. There was indeed a spring, but it was dry. The five or six houses, roofless, gnawed by wind and rain, the tiny chapel with its crumbling steeple stood about like the houses and chapels in living villages, but all life had vanished. I've seen many such places myself, as I'm sure you have. He could be describing many villages in the war-torn Middle East, or the former Soviet bloc, or the abandoned farms and townships of the American West. Every time I drive by one of these abandoned places, I'm struck with sadness over the fall of man and the ravages of evil. They make me long for the great renewal. Farther on, the traveler comes across a shepherd who invites him to stay the night in his little stone house. Before bed, the quiet peasant carefully selects 100 perfect acorns from a pile on his table and puts them in a sack. Next morning, as he goes to the fields, he soaks his sack in water. 
the traveler follows the shepherd to see what this curious man is up to. There he began thrusting his iron rod into the earth, making a hole in which he planted an acorn. Then he refilled the hole. He was planting oak trees. I asked him if the land belonged to him. He answered no. Did he know whose it was? He did not. For three years he had been planting trees in this wilderness. He had planted 100,000. Of the 100,000, 20,000 had sprouted. Of the 20,000, he still expected to lose about half. There remained 10,000 oak trees to grow where nothing had grown before. The narrator is then called away into the terrible life of an infantryman in the First World War. Amidst that carnage, he entirely forgets the shepherd. After demobilization, he understandably finds himself with a huge desire to breathe fresh air. So he sets out again through the barren lands. He again finds the shepherd, still at his work. The oaks of 1910 were then ten years old and taller than either of us. It was an impressive spectacle. I was literally speechless and, as he did not talk, we spent the whole day walking in silence through his forest. In three sections, it measured 11 kilometers in length and three kilometers at its greatest width. When you remembered that all this had sprung from the hands and the soul of this one man, without technical resources, you understood that men could be as effectual as God in other realms than that of destruction. Time passes, the peasant shepherd continues at his work, adding beech and birch trees to his reforestation efforts. In 1945, the narrator goes to see this quiet saint for the last time. He almost doesn't recognize the countryside. It has been utterly transformed. Everything was changed, even the air. Instead of the harsh, dry winds that used to attack me, a gentle breeze was blowing, laden with scents. A sound like water came from the mountains. It was the wind in the forest. On the side of the ruins I had seen in 1913 now stand neat farms, cleanly plastered, testifying to a happy and comfortable life. The old streams, fed by the rains and snows that the forest conserves, are flowing again. Their waters have been channeled. On each farm, in groves of maples, fountain pools overflow onto carpets of fresh mint. Little by little, the villages have been rebuilt. Counting the former population, more than 10,000 people owe their happiness to the humble shepherd. I don't know if Jean Giono was intentionally creating a parable of Isaiah's restoration prophecies, but the ancient ruins have been rebuilt and the places long devastated have been restored. The rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. The desert has been turned into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I love this little tale for that reason, for the model of perseverance and for the illustration of a life devoted to making the world a more beautiful place. Giono's redemption parable ends with this line. When I reflect that one man, armed only with his own physical and moral resources, was able to cause this land of Canaan to spring forth from the wasteland. I'm taken with an immense respect for that old and unlearned peasant who was able to complete a work worthy of God. We are each created to accomplish a work worthy of God. It is one of our deepest yearnings. And we will, in the kingdom, not just once, but many, many times over. Are we employed in the actual restoration itself? I don't know for certain. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated, certainly hints at it. And we know our God is a God of process. Look at how long your sanctification is taking. You might think I'm merely daydreaming about what we actually do in the kingdom, but friends, God creates us to be creators like he is. We are promised we will reign. We are given estates. We are told we will have vital roles in the coming kingdom. After a long absence, the master of those three servants came back and settled up with them. 
the one given $5,000 showed him how he had doubled his investment. His master commended him. Good work. You did your job well. From now on, be my partner. Matthew 25 in the message. Come and be my partner. That's the perfect way to put it. The idea behind the parable is promotion. And notice that the servants are promoted in the very things they are good at. God puts his renewed sons and daughters, creators like he is, in a recreated world and tells us to do exactly what he told Adam and Eve to do in the beginning. N.T. Wright therefore says, In Revelation and Paul's letters, we are told that God's people will actually be running the new world on God's behalf. The idea of our participation in the new creation goes back to Genesis when humans are supposed to be running the garden and looking after the animals. If you transpose that all the way through, it's a picture like the one that you get at the end of Revelation. Hitting your full stride. We haven't yet seen anyone in their true glory, including you. Yes, Mozart did start writing symphonies as a child, and Picasso could draw before he could talk. But most human beings are profoundly thwarted in their calling here, either because of wounding, assault, envy, or circumstances would never let them fly. For most human beings on this planet, work ranges from disappointing to oppressive. What does the kingdom offer those men who work the Indonesian sulfur mines or the tens of millions of modern slaves upon the earth? This is not what God intended How many Mozarts are there right now, hidden in slums and huts across the globe? All your creativity and gifting will be restored and then some when you are restored. All of that latent potency inside of you, so damaged here, marred, frustrated, never given the opportunity to grow and develop and express itself, all of it will be completely restored, including your personality. From there, you were able to act in the new world in ways far greater than Adam and Eve were able to act the first time around. And look at what humanity has been able to do with be fruitful rule in a broken world. You will have absolute intimacy with Jesus Christ, and his life will flow through your gifts unhindered. Imagine what we'll be capable of, how vast our powers in the new earth We know we shall be able to walk on water, for Peter did on this earth at Jesus' bidding. How far do our creative and artistic capacities reach? As George MacDonald wondered, when we are in our home, our natal home, when joy shall carry every sacred load, and from its life and peace no heart shall roam, what if thou make us able to make like thee, to light with moons, to clothe with greenery, to hang gold sunsets or a rose and purple sea. What will you do in the life to come? Everything you were born to do. Everything you've always wanted to do. Everything the kingdom needs you to do. I hate to stop there, but we need to stop there the end of chapter 8 in the book. This is going to conclude our four-part series here on the Ransomed Heart podcast of me just sharing big old chunks of my new book, All Things New, Heaven, Earth, and the Restoration of Everything You Love. I want to invite you to join me next week. I'm going to be doing a Facebook Live book group in the evenings on all things new. We did it as a staff and it was so rich. The team's like, you have to do this with our friends. So for five Thursday evenings, I'm gonna be live on Facebook Live talking about the book, but also getting into like some film and music and things that really enrich it and raising some questions uh, for you to journal about and think about. So it's gonna be a really rich experience. That'll be on our Facebook page. Uh, beginning Thursday, October 19th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast with John Eldridge on all things new, heaven, earth, and the restoration of everything you love.